Hello. I hope you are all doing well today. Boy, we've got some real light and shadow issues here. Ooh, now I'm in the dark. Oh, maybe that's a little bit better. Okay. I uh, oh nope, not better. <laughs> oh, that's better. Yeah. Maybe if I compromise, put it in the middle. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll be moving to the share screen anyway. Um, as I said, I hope you're all doing well today. Um, and uh, I hope you like dogs. Everybody should like dogs. I think, you know, humans have been with dogs for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, dogs have evolved to like us. And we have evolved to enjoy them. Um, the logic that people who have dogs to help them hunting and guard their stuff, whatever, um, and people who have dogs to just be friends with um, live longer and are more likely to successfully reproduce. So there's, I think there's an evolution um, that we someday people will probably find the genes within humans that make us pro-dog um, and within dogs that makes them pro-human. You know, dogs are quite different from um, the wolf ancestors, although Corduroy likes to think that um, he is a close descendant of the mighty wolf, but no, <laughs> he's not. Yeah, oh, sorry, dog. You just don't cut it as a mighty wolf. Um, uh, dogs have curly tails, um, uh, big ears and big heads. So they look more like babies um, and are also maybe less intelligent and definitely less independent minded than wolves. Um, I think we need wolves in the world. I think we need wolves in the United States. I think people like Sarah Palin who go around shooting wolves should be locked up. Um, okay. <laughs> Here we have a cat. Um, <laughs> we have a dog with a tongue. Like I said, you know, I think we like dogs. Okay. Um, here we are on prices and controls long run growth. Can we improve on the market? Um, price controls. Um, should we set higher minimum wages? Should we set rent controls? Should we tell businesses what to do? Should we regulate the safety of workplaces? Um, all those things, I'm not sure what the background, there's definitely paper. So I guess the background is uh, paperwork. Um, regulations can incur expenses. Um, billions and billions of dollars are spent filing taxes, filling out paperwork for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and um, uh, checking the safety of milk, inspecting meat packing places, um, inspecting food for safety. And of course, every now and then things slip through. Um, baby food has heavy metals in it. Um, uh, lettuce has listeria and other uh, um, dangerous bacteria. Um, or is listeria virus? I don't know. I'm an economist, historian, not a biologist. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, things to do. Uh, big points. In a perfectly competitive economy, government can only make things worse. Um, this is the base of conservative Republican economic policy. If you ever read um, uh, Milton Friedman's popular writings, like the book he did with his wife, Rose, um, Free to Choose, I think that there was a public television documentary based on it. Um, if you um, took economics using a textbook by 
um, you know, one of the more popular uh, Chicago school economists. Um, you know, I was going to say Greg Mankiw um, at Harvard, but he recognizes some problems with perfectly competitive markets, um, although he's pretty much on the side of no regulation. Um, uh, and against minimum wages. And that, that's one where, you know, much of the economic writing on minimum wages shows that minimum wages are good, um, but a lot, most of the standard microeconomics textbooks will say that they are bad. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, in arguing that we should uh, talk about the economy as perfectly competitive and perfectly competitive equilibrium, economists are doing a real disservice because compared to perfect competition, government can only make things worse. I mean, <laughs> if everything's perfect, then any change is going to make it worse. For example, when it comes to workplace hazards and safety, assuming perfect competition, labor markets will provide compensation for workers for the hazards at work and for disamenities. You'll have a higher pay if your workplace is less safe because nobody's going to go to it unless their workplace, uh, uh, you go to an unsafe workplace unless they're paid a lot. Um, so people are choosing this trade-off of higher wages and less safety. So to impose more safety will mean that they'll be less happy. They would rather have the higher wages and the less safe. <laughs> um, okay, now there are lots of reasons why regulations may be a good idea anyway. Um, because after all, generally, we don't have perfectly competitive markets. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that the regulations are going to be good because government makes mistakes too. So the real question, and, and I mean this in all seriousness, the real question is, are we better off with the mistakes that government makes or those that the free market makes or that free market, that the market makes? Um, and then on a second point that we'll get to, long-term growth changes the economy. And we'll get to that. Okay, assuming perfectly competitive markets and equilibrium, regulations are interference. And that's the, that's the term that's used, interfere in the market with this presumption that interference is going to be bad. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, come on, let's get real. There are no markets without governments because governments provide security. And you can say, oh, well, there'll be security. Look at the mafia. They provided security. Well, they provided security by creating it a shadow government. Um, governments provide common weights and measures. They, um, they provide systems of courts and justice where you can go and adjudicate issues. Governments provide language, standardized language, so that you can talk to each other. Um, you know, in France, it's the Académie Française. Um, you know, elsewhere there are, you know, the United States kind of became Noah Webster's dictionary. Um, but if you don't have a common language, then you can't do trade. Um, of course, you could have translators, whatever, which is the role that Jews often played in Mediterranean trade between um, Christian and Arab countries um, or states. Um, uh, and even between Christians and India um, uh, and Indian uh, states. Um, but you need some common basis. Um, and that is a role of government. Where you don't have effective governments, um, as in, you know, parts of West Africa today, as in 
um, a time since the collapse of the Soviet Union in parts, in parts of Russia, um, where you have failed states, as they're, as they're popularly called, um, you don't have effective markets. And without effective markets, it's, you know, it's a, a world of universal war. Um, Thomas Hobbes, the 17th century British philosopher, political philosopher talked about this, a war of all against all. You know, that's not a situation where you can have competitive markets. Um, so you need government. Uh, to say that governments interfere is just bad language because there are no markets without government. Um, okay. Uh, so it's not fair to do what Milton Friedman would do, uh, comparing imperfectly regulated markets with perfect competition. Perfect competition, everything's good. Anything but perfect competition is going to look bad compared to perfect competition. The real thing is you don't have perfect competition. You always have government creating markets. You'll never have perfect competition because um, there are locations, there are brands, there are monopolies of various strengths. Um, there's always imperfect competition. There are information problems. There are all the things that we've talked about and will continue to talk about. Um, because there's never perfect competition, the question is, are we better off with imperfectly regulated markets or imperfect competition? Um, you never have perfect government. I mean, people on the left will often say, oh, you just have to have the government come in regulated, everything will be perfect. Well, no. Um, uh, after the election of 2016, if we ever had any doubts, after the election of 2016, nobody on the left should assume <laughs> that government's going to make the right decisions. Um, you know, it never has. Uh, well, we've never been in a situation where government has always made the right decisions, and we've never been in a situation where markets have always been perfect. So the real alternatives are imperfect versus imperfect. Um, and behind that is the idea fundamental to a democracy. Can we act effectively as a community to regulate our markets? Um, you know, you could say, well, we should just have a dictatorship a la Plato's philosopher kings, but you know, it's like, come on, we're not going to have that. A dictatorship is, even if occasionally you get a wonderful, perfect dictator, it's not going to last. The next one's going to be lousy. Maybe you'll get two in a row and then you'll be like, wow, like the reign of the five good emperors um, in second century AD Rome. Um, yeah, great. But after that, you know, came um, Caligula, <laughs> you know, before them was Nero, after them was Caligula. It's like, you know, dictators don't work. Dictatorship doesn't work. Um, certainly hereditary dictators are going to be a chance that the child will be any good is virtually infinitesimal. Um, the chance that the emperor, the the dictator will remain good. Like, look at Henry VIII. He started out good, and then he got injured and became, you know, a murdering brute. Um, so dictatorship's no good. Then it's democracy. Can we have good government with a democracy? That's at least something worth trying. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill in the mid 19th century kind of laid out, I think as well as anybody, um, the, uh, the roadmap for good democratic governance. Um, you know, Madison laid out and the 
uh, in the Federalist Papers, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, um, but Madison especially laid out a roadmap for, well, this is the best we can do. Um, but I think the Tocqueville um, and Mill laid out the roadmap for doing better in democracy, but it's definitely very imperfect. And even if you get it right for a while, there's a tendency to then slack off the business of investing in our public governance. I think that's been a problem in the United States um, for the last 40 years. We thought we, you know, we thought we were doing better than well, we thought we were doing well. And it's like after Watergate, okay, we've got these problems solved. We don't have to pay that much attention. And then we got business coming in. Well, anyway. Okay. Market competition can encourage good behavior and discourage bad. I, you know, I mean, apart, you know, get away from perfect competition and just get real about this. Competition can be good. Competition can encourage businesses to try to meet consumer needs efficiently without having anybody in government tell them what to do because you have a profit motive. You have a, an incentive to make stuff at a lower cost and make it better so that you can sell more and make more profit. Similarly, competition for jobs can encourage workers to be productive. You know, you go to your job interview and you try to sell yourself and tell them that, hey, I will be a good worker. And you go and you start the job and you try to work hard so that they'll like you and they'll promote you and they'll give you bonuses. Now, to be sure, if businesses find that they're not selling their products well, do they know why? Let's say businesses start doing worse. You know, they get something wrong with their product. Do they know what the problem is where people stop buying this stuff? Maybe people will tell them. And that could be helpful, but are you going to believe them? You get these customers complaining and I want a refund. This is, a, you know, do you believe them? Uh, maybe customers will just stop buying. Well, do you know why they stop buying? Is your prices are too high? Your quality is too low? Your sales staff's bad? Maybe some other competitor is doing something different that you should be trying to imitate. You can spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. In the meantime, you may go broke. Especially since if people stop, have stopped buying your stuff, suddenly you have cash flow problems. Similarly, if you find your boss doesn't like you, do you know why? Are they going to tell you the truth? Maybe. Or maybe they don't like you because you won't sleep with them. Maybe they won't, don't like you because they want you to leave so they can give the job to some relative or somebody else. You know, maybe they're just hoping you'll quit so they can hire somebody ch cheaper. Who knows? You know, um, and that sort of information isn't always available in competitive markets because they are competitive. So you try to hide some things from you, your boss. Um, you try to hide some things from your customers and your customers are trying to hide things from you and your boss is hiding things from you. Your customers are hiding from you how much they actually are willing to pay for this. Um, uh, competition for workers encourages businesses to offer safe work. Well, yeah, sort of. It also encourages businesses to lie about how safe your jobs are so that they can pay you less. After all, if they tell you the truth that this work is really sucko, then nobody's going to take it unless they pay a lot of money. So they lie about how much fun it is to work here and how safe it is and how well you'll be trained to move on in life. Yeah, competition to get workers can encourage businesses to create health. You know, this is the logic behind the Reagan administration back in the 1980s, which scaled back safety regulation. And the Bush administration in the 2000s practically abandoned safety regulations. Um, and the Trump administration 
know practically about it. They eliminated safety inspections on the idea that, well, forget the Trump administration, but um, the Reagan and Bush administrations, the logic was that we don't need these regulations because competition to get workers will encourage businesses to create healthy and safe working places and attractive workplaces. Or workers will demand a compensating differential. In which case, okay, not our problem. You're getting paid for it. You're accepting it voluntarily. Okay, if you'd rather have money than safety, that's your business. We shouldn't. And in general, companies do pay an extra a premium for unsafe work places. But it depends on people knowing the jobs are unsafe. Of course, it depends on people having choices, which in many places, especially in times of high unemployment, not so much today, but often when unemployment is high, you don't have that many choices. And there are many places where you don't have that much choice. You're living in this small town in the Midwest. The factories have all closed, moved to China and Japan and Mexico. And there's the job at a paint shop. You kind of suspect it's probably unsafe. But boy, are you right. Um, and they're not paying you all that much extra because they don't have to. They can get people. Anyway. Um, but on average, companies do pay higher wages for workplaces that are unsafe. And this is, goes into the category that Adam Smith first wrote about, compensating differentials. Less pleasant work has higher supply curves. The supply curve shifts up when the work is less safe. You know. Here's a safe work along here, less safe work, really unsafe work. Nobody's going to take this job unless they paid at least $20. And to get more workers, you have to go over $30. Whereas the really safe job, you can get some, you can get a whole lot of people to half that wage. Of course, companies can hide how unsafe they are. And you know. Most workplaces, um, yes, there may be a death every now and then, but that's pretty uncommon. Yeah, so you can go for a long time. One thing that's been found is that um, when somebody dies at a workplace, there are a whole lot of quits. And there may be a wage increase then. But after a while, people forget. Um, God, my uh, older daughter um, worked. And the kind of place where, well, I don't know if you would expect it to be safe, but she works with homeless people, an agency that helps the homeless in Philadelphia. Um, and one day, some somebody got out of jail, made a gun, you know, instructions from the internet, put together a gun, came in there demanding that they tell him where his ex-girlfriend was, the woman that he had been abusing. Um, and he had gone to jail for beating her up. Um, he was out of jail. Uh, she was homeless for a while, and they placed her. Um, and they weren't going to tell her, tell him where she was. Um, so he showed up with a gun. He called. He called. He showed up with a gun. And um, the security guard was like, hey, Cool it, man. That's not cool to put that down. Yeah. He shot the security man, killed him. And then he shot the, the lock off the office where my daughter was. Um, this is exciting. Um, oh, okay, let me just kill this. Okay. Um Anyway, not a workplace where you expect that kind of thing. Uh, the gun fell apart, uh, so he pulled out a knife. He walked up to the... the my daughter was um, at a conference at the room right next to the entrance, so she stepped out. Like, what's going on? I, um, anyway, he started waving his knife around. 
Um, daughter was like, mm, okay, whatever you say, whatever you say, <laughs> you don't get the badge. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't think she gets much of a compensating wage differential for that kind of thing. Um, she, you could say she should have some compensating wage differential. She goes to a lot of bad neighborhoods and, you know, but um, whatever, instead she gets a compensating negative differential because this is work that people feel good about. So she'll do it at a lower pay. Maybe she should have a positive compensating differential because she has advanced degrees. Um, uh, these guys don't get much of a compensating differential. Oh, that's outdated, but uh, you know, they're probably paid more than that. 40 to 50,000. Okay, they get hazardous duty pay of $2,000 and whatever, they get health benefits. There they are. Ah, okay. Okay, let's say they take compensating differentials. They take a job knowing that it's unsafe, but they're happy to get the cash. What about, the, what about these other people? You know, um, you know, the wife, the sister, or the mother, the children, you know, who lost their father, or mother. You know, the widow gets a flag, death benefits, whatever. It's like, did this officer or soldier think about, in taking the job, did they think about the effect on their family if something happened? Or did they just think, oh, this is a good job, pays well? I, I don't mean to criticize, obviously, um, but there is an issue here. Since the person making the decision about the compensating differential, how much compensating differential they need to take that job is not the only person affected. There's an upward sloping curve, and the less safe job is higher up. Um, you know, to get more and more workers, you need a higher and higher pay because you start reaching into the pool of people who really don't like unsafe work. But if they're thinking about their family, their family may want it even more. You know, the family may be like, okay, $10, $15 is not enough compensation because we care about you and we depend on you. Okay, um, about 100,000 Americans each year are injured, 5,000 die on the jaw, uh, die each year, 95,000 die of occupational disease, many, many more than die of direct accidents. Um, fishermen get lost at sea. And this is a monument to the fishermen in Gloucester. They made a movie about it um, based on a best-selling book. Um, if any of you are from Cape Ann, you've, or if you visited Cape Ann, you've probably seen, um, they have this uh, statue of a fisherman. Um, a mon and this is at the base of the monument, uh, the base of the statue. Uh, many more die of occupational diseases. Um, lung ailments from burning stuff, um, lung ailments from has, uh, being in a hazardous building with asbestos or other toxins in the air. Um, of course, these days, um, the occupation, a major occupational disease is getting COVID. You know, you're in a crowded workplace, um, people coming in and out. Um, you know, not wearing masks, um, you get sick. Uh, here are some of the deadliest jobs, um, construction, fishing, um, uh, yeah, um, oh, that's logging, sorry. Roofers, yeah. Any of you ever done this? Um, aircraft pilots, um, electrical power lines, constructions down here, 
um, so fatality rate, loggers and fishermen up very far above everybody else, even roofers. Uh, refuse, sanitation workers, that's a pretty high accident rate, above minus. Hmm. Uh, farmers get hurt all the time. Um, you know, they um, also have high um, uh, um, occupational disease rates because of all the pesticides and chemicals that are used in commercial agriculture. Um, loggers don't have that much of that, that don't have problems of, of chemicals, um, but they tend to lose limbs. And if you cut the thing down wrong, uh, you know, I have felled a few trees and branches in my life. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm sure that if I knew better, I well, I wouldn't have done it, but okay. Um, jobs can be dangerous without being deadly. Sexual harassment. Um, rarely kills, but people, women, some men, um, can be traumatized, can spend years in therapy and anxiety disorders, whatever, can move before. Uh, move to occupations with much, much lower pay um, to avoid situations where they will have to undergo that again. Um, you want the genital flashing? Are you kidding me? And, you know, it's like, what kind of person does this? Um, uh, you know, um, so anyway. Um, but notice how common it is. And, you know, if you get to, um, if you look into um, uh, union organizing drives among women, one of the leading factors is they want a union for protection against sexual harassment, um, against the supervisors making unwelcome demands on them. Um, but it is also part of why women tend to cluster in occupations with other women for protection. <laughs> Just like, you know, women go into the dark parking lot with an escort um, for safety. Um, harassment changes lives. Uh, depression, change routine. Um, uh, you know, very few, 10% of women, 5% of men um, change jobs, um, which makes, if you just take this verbal sexual harassment, 76% of women and, sorry, one seventh of them um, filed a report or changed jobs. Uh, men, 35%, once again, one seventh of them filed a report or changed jobs. So at medical help, these things get expensive. 5% um, of women moved from a dorm, apartment house, or other residence, um, which of course means includes some who moved away from their parents. Okay, uh, so <laughs> that's Harvey Weinstein. Some do get away with it. No comment. Um, uh, Okay, occupational illnesses by category, skin disease. The most common are trauma, um, getting hit over the head by something. Um, you know, there's dust, toxic exposure, poisoning. Um, this is just what it was reported, and it's tw what, 20 years ago, so basically double the numbers. Um, that I just checked that recently on CDC. That is the most recent. Um, graphic, which I have. Notice 1999, that was the last year of the Clinton administration. Um, the Bush administration cut back on this. Um, and I guess, uh, well, I guess 2000 was the last year of the Clinton administration. That was the election year. Um, and the Obama administration didn't 
revive it, but getting this approved in Congress, getting money for occupational safety and health has been a real problem. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a general problem here that we're really bad at interpreting probabilities. Um, let me say that there's 1% chance that you will die on the job. Uh, but I'll pay you a hundred bucks, higher wage, thousand dollars, whatever. I'll pay you more money if you'll take this job. But there is a 1% chance that you'll die. What are you going to do? Well, maybe you'll try the job for a year and see how it goes. And lo and behold, you don't die. The chances are 99 out of 100, you won't die. So you say, oh, well, okay, I guess this is okay. You do it a second year. And you think, oh, okay, this is fine, piece of cake. I'm not, I'm not going to die. But every year, there's a 1% chance. If you do it throughout your lifetime, going from 20, age 20 to age 70, you've got a pretty good chance um, that you're going to die on the job. But that's pretty hard to work out. Now, if you also do it for 50 years, dying, let's say, at age 70 from the job, um, and you got $1,000 each year, then, well, that's $50,000. Is that worth your life? At age 20, you have like 20 years of life expectancy. Is it worth giving up those 20 years but to have had $50,000 in higher earnings? Maybe. I don't know. But how do people think about it? You know, we are not good at that. Um, that's why people buy lottery tickets. Um, you know, the, the bit, well, I mean, many people do it just for the fun of it. Um, but to be sure, if you buy a lottery ticket thinking you're going to make money, that's a really dumb thing to do. You know, that's, I mean, that's why the state is making so much money on the lottery, because you don't, you lose money. You don't make money. Ah, and what about other things? Debilitating illness? We hardly even have any idea of what those probabilities are. Being harassed or bullied on the job. Ooh, that's really, it's like, you know, okay, you know women are two or three times more likely to be harassed on the job than men, but that doesn't any particular workplace. You go there, you do a job interview, you ask about that. You know, uh, maybe you go to the ladies' room and you hope that somebody will show up so you can talk to them, but do you really want to talk to them about it if you're trying to get the job? And besides, what did they know? Well, I think Jane left because of something, but I'm not sure quite what it was. And she had an NDA. <laughs> when do you think it's going to happen that something bad is going to happen? You know, it's really hard to make these. So when you think about how much money do you want in compensation for higher risk, since we don't even know the risks and we have trouble thinking about it, I'm not sure it works very well. Now, the laissez-faire idea is that, okay, just leave the market free. People will get a higher wage and don't bother them. The liberal idea is, well, we'll have government safety rules. We'll put in a bureaucracy. We'll have people go around, check the workplaces. And let me tell you about that. Um, one day, um, when my brother was starting, you know, he'd been, he was going to be taking over with my father's business um, because his, the other, my father didn't believe it. My father was a sexist. My mother was a sexist. It didn't occur to them that one of the daughters could do it. Um, the oldest brother was making way more money on his own. And I was, I wanted to be a college professor. I didn't want to be running a business, even though, you know, very successful business, largest coffee business in the New York area. Um, uh, anyway, 
uh, one day, the OSHA guy showed up, Occupational Safety and Health. And he started walking through the warehouse. And my father, it was a unionized place. Um, my father was a good guy. I'm going to say that, but I, yeah, I think he was. Um, it was a safe place. Um, they had uh, very safe working conditions. They were very careful about that. Um, and the OSHA guy was going around. My brother was taking him and they, they were looking at different things. And then he kept looking at other things and then he kept looking at other things. And my father stuck his head out the office, looked down in the warehouse and saw that my brother was still there with the OSHA guy. So my father had the secretary page my brother. Um, and my brother came up the stairs. My father went down the stairs. Five minutes later, the OSHA guy left. And my brother said, oh, what happened? My brother, legal services attorney, good liberal fellow. My father was a good liberal too. Like I said, they had a union, everything. Um, my father said, he was going to stay here until you gave him his bribe. And if it took too long, he was going to find something and write us up. <laughs> That's that could be bureaucracy, you know. Oh, um, okay. Could uh, we could give workers more safety than they actually want? We could have a strong union. That's what my father's place had. They had a strong union. The Teamsters made sure that it, the workplace was safe because the workers, this was not like some of the other Teamsters. This was a very democratic Teamsters union, local, and they looked out. Okay, government regulations can cause trouble. You can have a minimum wage that's well above the equilibrium wage. Um, so we say, okay, nobody can work below this wage. Well, at that wage, a lot of people are going to want the job. But how many people are going to be hired? Here's your marginal product of labor curve. Very few people are going to be hired at that high wage. We'll create unemployment. We call this excess supply, but it's unemployment. This is the graph that you'll get in most orthodox economics classes and the argument against the minimum wage. Um, and government's basically been listening to it. The minimum wage has, it peaked in real value in 1973. And since then, oh, sorry, here, real wages. Here's the minimum wage. It peaked in real value in 1969, and it's basically been drifting down ever since. We haven't raised the minimum wage since um, 2013, nine years. Um, well, I could say 2010, 2011. And here's average wages, by the way. They've been going up the last couple of years. But given the increase in productivity, isn't it interesting that real wages haven't, basically haven't risen since the early 1970s? High minimum wage might be good if labor demand's very in, uh, inelastic. There we go. Very inelastic minimum wage, uh, very inelastic labor demand. Minimum wage here. This is the same graph as this, but inelastic labor demand. And so there's very little unemployment. And all these other workers are getting a big raise. Higher wages, safer working conditions. Besides, workers may be more productive. Safer working conditions, you're avoiding all those workplace injuries. Fewer quits, higher morale, workers work harder. Pay people a higher wage. Companies have an incentive to train them to be more productive. In which case, the demand curve may even be upward sloping. Higher wages may raise employment. Rent controls can be also be a good or bad idea depending on elasticity. 
if he is the demand, he is the supply, and we set the way the rent low. Fixed rents, rent controls will lead to excess demand. If it's very inelastic, maybe a little excess demand, but not much. And in the meantime, renters get a break. Would you like lower rents? The evidence on rent controls, mm, not a great thing, but it does shift well from landlords to tenants. Yeah. Um, price controls can be good or bad, depending on elasticities. Evidence on minimum wage. Minimum wages raise wages and incomes for the poor and working class, push up wages for even middle um, income workers. Minimum wage increases may lead workers and businesses to be more productive and have little effect on employment. Minimum wages in Denmark are like $23 an hour. And Danish workers have higher standard of living and you can't find a cashier in Denmark, I've been told. It's always automatic checkout because at that wage, it's not worth paying the cashiers. Sometimes I like having a cashier. You know, the automatic checkout doesn't always work for me. Um, usually I love technology and I love not having to deal with the person, but it doesn't always work. Setting price maximums can cause troubles too. Excess demand, here's minimum uh, rent controls, create a shortage. Okay. You know, what you often get in wartime is exorbitant profits, highly inelastic demand, um, supply shortages, people get huge uh, price increases for their goods. Um, so governments put in price controls to limit those profits. Um, it's all about demand elasticity and supply elasticities. Um, rationing as an alternative to using the price system when there are shortages. The shortage could lead a few people to have, you know, I mean, this lady who's buying up all that meat, maybe she's going to resell it <laughs> and make a killing. Maybe he charged really high prices and only the really rich could afford it. Um, the Red Sox sell tickets to their loyal fans, at low market rate, so do many musicians. The scalpers get all the profit. Is that fair? Maybe the Sox should get the profit. You know, Bruce Springsteen does the same thing until recently. You know, he's decided to kill the market for the, the resale market and just charge higher prices himself. Selena Gomez, his friend gave her a kidney. A kidney? Wow. For free? How much would she have paid? Well, life saving kidney, not just her. Um, there's another one, another actress, uh, uh, Sarah Highland. Uh, she was in Modern Family. She had two kidneys. The first one from a father didn't work. So her brother gave her a kidney. Boy, how much would you pay to, to something that will keep you alive? Oh, yeah, there's Sarah Highland. Yeah, she got a kidney from her father, and when that failed, from her brother. She didn't pay for them. Is something wrong with this? Shouldn't she have to pay for these things? Okay, should we allow the sale? Uh, how much are kidneys? $62,000. Um, in, in the US, it looks like in Israel, people pay $160,000 for a kidney. Um, China, they pay $40,000. Um, what country is that? $20,000. Um, sorry, I don't recognize it. Um, Maximilian Robespierre, he was guillotined. New York City has price controls on apartments, some apartment rentals. Boy, I was looking at um, this building on Amsterdam Avenue, um, is near Columbia. And one summer, I was looking for a place to live. Stay, stay in the city over the summer. Um, and I 
found a, I could get a room up here or so for $150 a month, you know, $200 a month. It was something reasonable. It was a room, a share with a bunch of people. Turns out the guy who held the lease was subletting. Um, his lease was $150 a month, rent control. And he was subletting to three other um, parties, um, collecting $600 a month or so, $450, $600, something like that, um, paying a fraction of that and living on the rest. And then he was going to turn this common space into another unit and rent that out, at which point I, I left and moved in with my girlfriend for a while. Okay. Um, the boss. Yeah, but he's kind of given up on that. Um, the issue is always the same, though. Government to the market. There's no third solution. That maybe we need a little bit of both. You know, markets are not perfect. We'll talk more about this another time. Governments also make mistakes. Um, okay. Moving on, economic growth over time. Uh, societies get richer. But what we get more and more stuff. We get more food, we get cars, we get cell phones. They're things we don't get. We don't get more time. We get goods and material. And those prices fall over time because we're getting more and more productive and making them. So we get more and more stuff. But because that stuff is being cheaper, something else is becoming relatively more expensive, and that's time. We don't get more time. We have more stuff, but we don't have more time. So in terms of stuff, our time's more expensive. Services are different from goods. The value of the service depends on the time spent on it, and that doesn't change. We still have only 24 hours in the day. To be sure, we sleep less than we used to. People in rich countries sleep less than people in poor countries. Um, their time is more valuable. So we spend more of our time on the, cell, on the phones and on watching videos and whatever. But if you want to play Chopin's Minute Waltz, it still takes you a minute. You can't, you could can do it in 30 seconds, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. And there are many services we value only because of the time that's spent. Yeah. Teaching, child rearing, counseling, sex. Yeah. If you're not going to spend the time, then the service is invaluable. You can try to economize, and Americans are notorious in the early 20th century, uh, through the 20th century, for having the quickie. And European women would complain, oh, American men, they wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You know, and American men would be like, oh, European women are so sexy. They spend time at it. You know, yeah. Um, we can be too busy spending money to enjoy life. You know, you know we can save time by substituting goods. And we definitely do that. Take out dinners, frozen food. Um, wash and wear clothes, ready to wear uh, clothes. Um, you know, we can watch videos um, and write and dictate memos and emails in the shower. You know, we can use a TV as a babysitter. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff happens. You know, but don't answer the phone while having sex. That's really rude. Um, and in the end, you can't replace time. Time is love because it's not reproducible. So if you're not going to spend the time with people, then 
you know, you're saying that they're not valuable to you. Um, and it's hard these days. There's so many distractions. There's so many other things you could be doing than being with your friends. But in the long run, it's the friends of love that matters, not the stuff you have. Yeah. Oh, God. That's an obscene picture. Forget it. Um, okay. Other issues. We'll talk more about the distribution of income. And of course, this no equilibrium of supply curve slope up. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about that. I'll circle that. Ooh. Okay. Uh, okay, perfect information. Yeah, yeah, monopoly. Yeah, we've talked about this. Okay, takeaway points. There is tools, tools. Perfectly competitive equilibrium might maximize social welfare and government regulations cause troubles, but the markets don't work that way. So we're never, you know, we're never quite at the right place. And then since economic growth you know, creates its own problems, you, know, you wonder whether we could do better. People will choose to have too many goods for their own happiness. Should we find ways to limit goods and make people spend more time? you know, socializing and other activities. Yeah, think about it. Everybody should have a dog. No question about that. Everyone should have a dog and a pool. Okay, we will stop the share. It was a pleasure chatting with you guys. These are, these are big issues, you know, and I don't necessarily have, I wouldn't claim to have the answers. Um, but uh, the issues that you should be grappling with throughout your entire lives, because these are the fundamental issues um, in human civilization and in life. So take them seriously. Have a good day. Bye-bye.